Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the April 1st work session for the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Time is 4.01, and I'm calling the meeting to order. I'm Vice Chair Ashley Stolzman, and this meeting is being held electronically and being recorded. I ask that folks please use the raise hand button to indicate that you have a question or would like to speak. You can probably find it on the right hand side of your screen. Once it's your turn, the staff will unmute your microphone and call on you to speak. Make sure you've unmuted on your end when you're called on. After your remarks, please remute yourself. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the question box. Please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions related to agenda items. Today we're doing roll call based on the login, and so that takes us to our public comment period. We'll now open the meeting for public comment. I request that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior, prior public hearing has been held before the Board of Directors. We will now unmute all participants in the meeting. If you've joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button, and we will call on you to begin speaking for public comment. If you've joined by phone, please unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You'll have three minutes to speak, after which we will ask you to wrap up your line and you'll be muted. Melinda Stevens, do you see any hands raised? I do not. Um, I have also unmuted everyone. So if anyone would like to speak, they can. Muted. Thank you. Seeing no one, that closes the public comment period. We will accept the summary of the February 5th, Ashley, are you waiting for a motion? No, I'm sorry. I don't know if I was cut out or muted, but all I was saying um, was that we've now, so we've accepted the comments in, um, and we are now on the agenda item discussion of urban arterial multimodal safety improvement set aside, and Ron Papstorf is going to give us a presentation on that. So Ron, we can see your screen, but you are still muted. Okay, Ron, we should be able to hear thank, you now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, sorry for the confusion there. It was, it was not responding quickly enough to my unmuting. Um, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, board members and alternates. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here this afternoon to talk about the Urban Arterial Multimodal Safety Improvements uh, Set Aside Program. Uh, we last talked to the board about this on February 19th, and we wanted to take the opportunity today to give an informational briefing on the work that we've done with CDOT to establish the um, <clears throat> eligibility rules and selection process that we anticipate bringing forward. Uh, to the RTC and the board in April. So as you'll um, recall, CDOT Region 1 had previously allocated uh, $25 million of state flexible Senate Bill 267 funds for urban arterial safety improvements and $26 million of state transit Senate Bill 267 funds for Denver area arterial street pre-BRT and BRT related transit improvements uh, within the CDOT Region 1 portion of Dr. Cog. At the February 24th uh, meeting, the, the, the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee recommended the creation of a $26 million urban arterial multimodal safety improvements program using $9 million of unanticipated Dr. Cog directed surface transportation block grant funds, leveraging $17 million of CDOT directed SDBG funds. That recommendation was meant to come to RTC and the board at the March meetings, and unfortunately those meetings uh, needed to be canceled 
as part of our response to COVID-19 while we were working out the details of getting virtual meetings up and running. Um, so the, that recommendation from TAC will come forward to RTC and the board at the April meetings. Um, CDOT and Dr. Cog have jointly determined that it's our desire to allocate the three funding sources, the Senate Bill 267 funds, uh, both flexible and transit funds, along with the SDBG funds as one, uh, one project allocation process, um, totaling approximately $77 million through a consolidated call for projects. So I'm here this afternoon to give you a preview of the work we've done uh, between Dr. Cog and CDOT to establish eligibility rules and selection process. So let me just um, get into the program purpose as a reminder. Uh, this is envisioned as a joint effort between CDOT and Dr. Cog to support infrastructure projects that improve safety, especially for vulnerable users along urban arterials within the Dr. Cog uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization boundary and consistent with CDOT's and Dr. Cog's Vision Zero efforts. <clears throat> the program goals, as we've previously talked about with the board, are to reduce fatal and serious injury crashes on the region's transportation system, support a transportation system that accommodates all modes of travel safely, um, improving transit access and multimodal mobility around the region, uh, support the development of connected urban and employment centers, uh, in multimodal corridors, and finally provide safe access, to opportunity, mobility for all residents, um, all ages, incomes, including vulnerable users. So the available funding, um, as I referenced, includes three funding categories, the Senate Bill 267 uh, flexible dollars uh, or transit dollars, $26 million within Region 1. The state flexible Senate Bill 267 monies totaling $25 million available within Region 1. Those have both been allocated by the uh, Colorado Transportation Commission. And then the third um, funding category is the, cent of the surface transportation block grant funds that I referenced previously uh, between the Dr. Cog directed funds and the CDOT directed funds totaling $26 million. Those would be available for projects located anywhere within the Dr. Cog MPO boundary area. Um, the 267 funds are limited to projects located on arterial state highways that otherwise meet the program criteria. The surface transportation block grant funds would be available for projects on any federal aid eligible roadway, especially those that are on the high injury network that Dr. Cog has identified in partnership with local jurisdictions as part of the Vision Zero planning effort um, that also um, otherwise meet program criteria. And just for reference, the federal aid eligible roadways are generally collector facilities and above, and we are limiting it to non-freeway uh, non uh, facilities, so non-limited access facilities. The funding requirements that we've worked out with CDOT would include that um, all eligible and funded projects must be able to meet must be able to complete all the project activities and submit all billings by no later than June 1st of 2024. Um, this is to help us meet the project delivery and spending requirements of the Senate Bill 267 funds um, as enacted by the Colorado legislature. Um, applicants may specify a preference for state-only funds for projects that are located on state highways, um, but at this point, CDOT and Dr. Cog can't guarantee that a specific funding source for a particular project will be available. We'll have to look at the full set of projects uh, that get submitted and how many projects request state-only funds as opposed to uh, federal funds. The um, minimum grant request is $250,000 of uh, funding from this pot of money. The maximum grant request will be limited to $15 million per project, and the minimum local match that will be required is 20% um, uh, funds outside of this pot of money. Uh, we have, uh, we are recommending in partnership with CDOT that we not put a limit on number of applications uh, by applicant. Um, so the, the restrictions on requests simply relate to the minimum and the maximum grant requests. We are proposing um, a number of evaluation criteria categories that are, should be showing up on your screen uh, related to safety, 
enhanced mobility for vulnerable users and transit, some other considerations, including innovation, technology, the opportunity to devolve state highways to local jurisdiction, benefit cost, um, evaluation, et cetera, uh, the level of public support and local match provided by, uh, demonstrated by the applicant and the readiness for the project, the extent to which the applicant demonstrates the ability to meet the project delivery requirements. The proposed weighting for each of those um, evaluation criteria category are 35% for safety, 25% for advanced mobility and transit, 10% for those other considerations, 10% for public support and local match, and 20% for readiness. The, um, so the application and selection process that we have worked out with CDOT and propo proposing for your consideration, uh, we expect that assuming that the board and the RTC approve the um, creation of the program and the selection uh, criterion process that we would be ready to open the call for projects on April 20th, uh, that applications would be due to CDOT uh, Wednesday, June 3rd. Those, app those applications then would be scored um, and reviewed by a scoring and selection panel that would have representatives from CDOT uh, Region 1, CDOT Division of Transit and Rail, um, the CDOT Region 1 uh, Deputy Director, Dr. Cog, and RTD. Um, the scoring and review developed by that panel would then go to an advisory committee it would be made up of two CDOT staff and one staff person from each of the eight Dr. Cog subregions. That group would review the scoring and formulate a recommendation uh, that then would go to the scoring and selection panel um, to review that advisory committee recommendation and put together a final recommendation uh, that would go then um, make the, recommend the funding recommendation for all of the projects that were uh, that applied for funding. Uh, we'd have some internal review and ultimately um, review and approval by uh, the appropriate boards and commissions um, around the middle of July. With that, that concludes my high-level um, comments and overview. And again, I'd be happy to um, entertain any questions or comments. Um, I will add that the Transportation Advisory Committee did did take action at their March uh, 23rd meeting, uh, unanimously recommending approval of the eligibility uh, rules and selection process criteria. Uh, that document, uh, that draft document was included with your agenda packet uh, this afternoon. And I will note that uh, the TAC did make one uh, minor amendment to that document to remove the term road diets from the list of project and project component examples. That was the only change. Uh, and then that final recommendation, again, was unanimously made. And that will be brought forward to RTC and the board at your April meetings. Thank you for the presentation, Mr. Papstorf. I um, would like to remind people at this time to use the raise hand button to indicate that you have a question or would like to speak with a comment. Once it's your turn, the staff will unmute your microphone and call on you to speak. If you're having any technical problems or questions, you can use the chat on the right-hand side to talk to staff and they can work through it with you. So at this time, I'm gonna to turn to Melinda Stevens and ask if she will call on people who have raised hands. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it looks like our first question will be coming from Kevin Flynn. So Mr. Flynn, I will unmute you now so you may ask your question. Well, thank you. And Ron, you just talked about the, the subject of my question, which was why, what was the discussion at RTC about road diets and why was that taken out? What, how was that seen as different from traffic calming or complete street improvements? Uh, if you have any examples of those things. Um, thank you. I just, for the rest of the questions, if you just want to go back and forth, that's just fine with me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate that. Uh, sorry for the vocal there. Um, Director Flynn, I think I think there wasn't a lot of disagreement uh, at the Transportation Advisory Committee of, about that concept, except for you know there it is a little bit of a hot button term, and I think there are different different ideas about what that actually means. And I think to be clearer and attain more clarity in the in the eligibility 
rules and um, selection process, it just made more sense to kind of take that out because in different circumstances that, that, you know, that may be, or some version of that may be the appropriate traffic calming measure that, that is referenced. I think there was just a concern that that was a little bit of a, a diff, difficult term to, to fully define and include in the document. Did, did, I guess um, maybe to help me out, would, is a road diet different than traffic calming? I mean, how do they view road diet? Maybe I have a different view of it. Yeah, Director Flynn, uh, Ron Papsdorf again, that, that's exactly the point. I think a lot there are lots of different ideas about what that term actually means. Probably the most prevalent concept is that you're actually um, removing existing through travel lanes oh, um, okay. as opposed to traffic calming, which sort of maintains the existing capacity, but maybe um, includes design features that help slow or calm traffic. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then at this time, it looks like we have a question from Director Maurer. So I will now unmute you and you may ask your question. Oh, hold on. It looks like we're having some trouble unmuting you. Uh, it looks like you're self muted. So you will, at this point, you're unmuted, but you'll need to unmute yourself as well. Okay, there you go, Director Maurer. Director Maurer, can you hear us and can you speak? Okay, it seems like we're not able to hear you, so you might need to uh, type your question in the question pod. I'm very sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next director. Looks like Director Elrod has a question, so I will unmute you now so you may ask. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Perfect, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do a follow-up to the question on the road diet. Is it, so a, ro a road diet can be a traffic calming measure. Um, so therefore, by removing it, it's not excluding it as a um, project um, opportunity, correct? Um, Director Elrod, that's correct. Again, the that piece in the do, in the draft document on page two are simply um, project and project component examples. It's not meant to be an exclusive list. Um, and so, it, if it's the right solution that has good public support within a community, and it's the right solution to solve the problem um, on that facility, then um, removing it from the document does not exclude it from eligibility. Thank you. All right, and at this time, I do not see any other questions. So now we'll turn to Lisa. Lisa, did you get any questions in the panel? I did not, but it looks like Director Maurer signed back in and has her hand raised again. So um, Melinda, if you could uh, try to unmute her one more time. Absolutely. Oh, let's see which one. I'm showing her as unmuted on my end. Oh. Director Maurer. Okay, go ahead, Director Maurer. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we can. Oh. Thank you, Vice Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Papsdorf. And I, sorry, I blinked out there, so I hope I, I'm not repeating myself here. One thing I'm wondering is the call for the projects is April 20th. And I don't know if other agencies are running into uh, similar concerns, but when I brought up this to um, the staff, my staff, um, they're, they're very, being very, very conservative on moving forward with projects just because they, um, there's a pretty drastic cut in sales tax revenues. So my question is, has, have they thought about pushing the date out a little bit just to see where maybe where we all are, or is that not a consideration for other agencies? Um, thank you for the question, Director Maurer. And I know that um, is, it's, it's an issue and I, I, sh I share the, the concern and the thought. Um, at this point, 
um, you know, I think we've got some time to figure that out and, and see how things shake out with the current situation. Um, at this point, we're proposing to sort of keep on schedule at least for the approval of creating the program and the approval of the, um, the eligibility rules and selection process. And I think as we get closer to April 20th, um, where we will we will certainly reassess and have conversations about whether it's appropriate to either delay the call or extend the call for projects to kind of allow things to, um, to settle down. We're trying to see if I can go back to that overall schedule again. So uh, again, I think um, under this current schedule, applications wouldn't be due until the beginning of June. Um, and then we've got some process to um, identify and actually make recommendations on the selected projects by mid-July. Um, I think at the very least, my commitment is that we will continue to talk to our local government partners and CDOT as that April 20th date um, nears and have a, have a real conversation about whether it makes sense to um, delay or extend the call um, with the caveat that you know, part of these funds, the 267 funds, do have a do have a, a real hard sort of deadline for getting the funds mm -hmm. expended. And we do want to make sure that we allow enough time from project selection to project completion to allow project sponsors to actually complete those projects and fully utilize those grant funds. Well, and I guess I would look at it that I would hope they would extend that date as well. But yeah, thank you for the answer. Thank you. So one last chance for folks to raise their hand to ask questions or make comments on this topic. Okay. Melinda Stevens, do you see any other hands raised? I do not. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, Ron, and we look forward to hearing more about it at a future date. That Thank takes you very us to much. Appreciate it. That takes us to our next order of business, which is the draft 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, sometimes called the MBRTP, Scenario Outcome Results. Jacob Rieger from Dr. Cox Staff is going to tell us more about that. Jacob? Jacob, we can see your slides now and we have you on mute. I can okay can you hear me now we can hear you okay good thank you um thank you madam chair um so um as our chair just stated this item concerns uh scenario analysis for a 2050 metro vision regional transportation plan we last visited with you about this topic at your november and december board meetings uh, when we were defining scenarios and we said once we had scenario def scenarios defined um, at your December meeting uh, to give us about three months to actually code and, and run and test these scenarios. And that's the work that staff has been doing uh, over the past three months. So now in this presentation today, we want to show you uh, the initial results, excuse me, the initial results that we have found uh, from that work. Um, I will say it is a long presentation, but I think it will go fairly smoothly. Um, because of the length of the presentation and the amount of information that we're about to convey to you, uh, we will have uh, a few slides sprinkled in where we'll pause for questions. Um, I think logistically it'll work best to have sort of major questions held to the end, but we do want to give folks a chance to um, ask some clarifying questions as we go through the presentation. Another um, sort of parameter I might set for, or maybe sort of, you know, helpful foundation for today is that because of the volume that, of information that we're gonna present in this presentation, um, as well as you have the table that's in your packet, um, today's our goal is simply just to help contain these results to you and help you understand uh, sort of what we're learning from these scenario results. Um, in future meetings, we'll have conversations about the implications of these results and how, how that influences our path forward on the 2050 uh, Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. So with that, uh, let me start with just a reminder of our overall project schedule. Um, we've been um, we've been at this for maybe about a year or so in our major 2050 plan update. Uh, we started last summer with a lot of public and stakeholder outreach, um, county fairs, festivals, 
Uh, we did an online survey and other other engagement techniques, a lot of which we're continuing through the plan. So as it indicates, we're now in this phase two, uh, where we're talking about scenario analysis and how um, that's going to lead us forward on sort of our next big conversation of investment priorities, trade-offs, and choices as we put the plan together. We'll be putting the actual plan together this coming summer and fall with the goal of having the draft 2050 plan, a draft of the plan done by the end of this calendar year. And then we need to adopt the plan um, by early next year, spring of spring of 2021, uh, to meet a federal deadline that we have next year. Um, specifically regarding our scenario planning process, um, again, just kind of a reminder of, of that workflow on that. Um, again, starting out with our phase one engagement that we did last summer, and then last summer and fall, we had been working on preparing the tools um, that we used in the analysis of the results we're about to show you. So that's primarily our 2050 land use forecast that we did for this scenario work uh, with our uh, land use model urban sim, and then our updated uh, travel model focus. Um, so obviously we're here now at defining and testing scenarios um, and then leading forward to, as I've said, putting the plan together. Um, specifically in this work, just sort of a reminder, you know, what is this in the big picture in terms of scenario analysis? Um, this is this is really sort of a sketch planning exercise. We're really interested in some of these relationships between uh, urban form, our multimodal transportation system, and how that influences travel and mobility patterns. And I think that'll be more clear as we go through the results today, that when we, when we test certain things, when we try certain things, uh, we definitely see some interesting outcomes uh, based on that. Um, just a reminder kind of of what this is and, and frankly what it isn't. Um, as I've said, we're exploring, you know, what we might say are what if alternative futures. You know, what if we try this? What if we do that? What happens? Um, we're making relative comparisons between scenarios and baseline. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So it's not so much about absolute numbers or absolute results. It's more about relative comparisons between scenarios and trends between scenarios. We are not doing a rigorous evaluation of scenarios nor are we choosing or judging scenarios. This is not a pass, fail, good or bad type of exercise. Um, again, we're looking at several different versions of the future that encompass our entire multimodal transportation system. Um, but as I've said, this will lead um, to a further uh, future conversation about choices and trade-offs from individual scenarios. And this will be more clear as we get into the results that different scenarios behave differently in terms of the results that they show. And so a single scenario or even a combination of scenarios isn't necessarily going to uh, register on every single sort of aspect of our transportation system. Um, so as we get into it more and look at the results and lead to our future conversations about what does that say about choices, trade-offs, priorities for this region. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Alvin Vidal, who's going to walk us through uh, the land use and transportation scenarios that we uh, that we tested. Alvin? So for our scenario analysis, we looked at two different components, uh, land use side and the transportation side. Uh, on both, we were comparing them against a 2050 base, and I'll get into what each of those means in a couple slides. Uh, on our land use side, we had two scenarios, our infill and our center scenario, and then we had five transportation scenarios, off-peak congestion, managed lanes and operations, travel choices, transit, and automated and connected vehicles. Now, in addition to comparing each of these scenarios against their respective base, we also ended up combining some of them. So you'll see in a couple slides which land use scenarios we actually combined with our transportation scenarios to see if there were any uh, synergies when we started combining those. Next slide. Uh, we know the Dr. Cog uh, region is gonna continue to grow out to our new horizon year of 2050. Uh, we're expecting an extra 1 million people and 800,000 jobs in the region by 2050. Uh, the data you're seeing here was used consistently across each of the scenarios that you're going to be seeing in the upcoming slides. So the same population, the same employment projections were used for each scenario run. Next slide. Once we get into the actual scenario analysis, you're gonna be seeing these three key metrics that we use to compare the scenarios against each other and the 2050 base. Uh, vehicle miles traveled, transit walk and bicycle trips, and vehicle hours of delay. We wanted to introduce them here so you could see uh, where we are currently in 2020 and where we expect to be in 2050, assuming uh, our 2050 base scenario. Uh, similar to our employment and population projections, we expect these three metrics to increase out to our 2050 base. Next slide. 
On our transportation scenarios, when we're comparing them to a 2050 base, what we really mean is our 2040 fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. So we're looking at our funded capacity projects that are currently in our adopted 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. So these maps illustrating which roadway capacity projects are included and which rapid transit system projects are included. Now, when we're saying 2050 base, that's just to give us a reference to our new horizon year. It is our 2040 funded projects run on a 2050 baseline use. Next slide. Now I mentioned we weren't just comparing scenarios against their respective bases, we were also combining a couple of them. So in this presentation, we're gonna start out with what those results are when we compare our 2050 base land use with our four transportation scenarios you see there, as well as what happens when we compare our infill scenario with our travel choices scenario and our center scenario with our transit scenario, uh, using both of those to see what were uh, hopefully complementary scenarios and how they work together. Next slide. We'll pause here, see if there are any questions uh, for this first part of the presentation. So Melinda Stevens, at this time, do you see any folks with their hands raised or are there any people who would like to use the hand raise feature at this time and ask a question? Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. At this point in time, I am not seeing any hands raised. Thank you, Alvin, you wanna keep going? Thank you, Madam Chair. So the first part of the presentation, I'll be handing off to Robert. He'll show you what the results are when we combine our 2050 base land use with each of these four transportation scenarios by themselves. Next slide. So Robert, if you're there, if you'd like to. Okay, sorry, I was muted by, not myself. Here I am. Uh, Good afternoon. Um, the first scenario we're going to talk about is what we call the off-peak congestion scenario. The concept was to alleviate some of the off-peak congestion we have in the region, knowing that there will always be a significant amount of peak hour congestion. Uh, so we, we determined this is a kind of smaller scale. It's still a very massive infrastructure project, but smaller scale than some of the other scenarios. And um, some of the most congested off-peak corridors were I-25, basically from E-470 to C-470, and I-270. So we added general purpose lanes to those, as well as took the model and um, made some pretty major uh, improvements to the interchanges at four major bottleneck uh, locations throughout the region. Uh, next slide. So for each one of these, uh, we're going to have kind of an introduction slide. We're going to discuss some of the highlights, the outcomes. That's what this slide is. And then we'll get into some graphs uh, on the final slide. So three slides per scenario. Uh, when we did widen I-25 and 270 through the region, through the main part of the region, uh, through the Beltway, I should say, uh, we had really small changes in terms of vehicle miles traveled and transit trips, less than 1% change in those values. Um, though it did affect regional delay, um, you know, a lot of the delay in the region is on those corridors. It only affected it by 3%. That said, obviously that corridor would have major improvements in terms of travel time and the number of people that are able to travel through that corridor. So you can see that um, even with that widening, uh, travel time would be more than um, it is today, but less than it would be during the base and significantly more vehicles and people would be um, able to travel through that corridor, which would divert some traffic off of uh, the complementary arterial network. Next slide. As Alvin mentioned, we're kind of looking at three uh, metrics for each one of these scenarios. And what we're looking at here is the percent change from 2020. So for example, when you're looking at vehicle hours of delay and it's a 98% increase, that means that vehicle hours of delay basically doubles from today to 2050. So this uh, scenario had a relatively small impact on um, VMT and transit walk bike trips, a little dip in uh, delay, but still a major increase from 2020. Next slide. Next one we'll talk about is the managed lanes and operations scenario. This is a freeway managed lanes scenario. And it's a significant addition of um, basically managed lanes, express lanes, uh, based on the HPTE express lanes master plan. So those uh, freeways highlighted in orange would have additional uh, the addition of a managed lane. The ones highlighted in blue already have some form or planned uh, managed lane on them. There's a the additional concept that it, 
for this scenario, we would improve operations, uh, primarily incident management, uh, whether that be vehicles, additional um, roadside assistance, but that because of reduced uh, incidents on the roadway, that there would be improved capacity. Next slide. So as you might expect, uh, adding that much more capacity in a managed lane, there's significant reduction in the amount of delay compared to the 2050 base. Uh, because of that additional capacity, VMT did uh, inch up about 800,000 more daily VMT compared to the base scenario. That's about a 3% increase. Um, you know, we, we don't exactly model this, but as managed lanes would be available, there would be an option for reliability more frequently. If you were running late to pick up your kid or something like that, there would be an option on almost every freeway to pay um, a fee and get into that managed lane and get where you needed to. Um, we'd also assume, you know, more safety here um, because of the improved incident management and fewer secondary crashes, which obviously has a huge impact on the safety of people as well as congestion. Next slide. So again, compared to the base, uh, a little bit uptick in VMT, uh, corresponding downtick in transit and walk bike, but uh, this one really shined in the vehicle hours of delay being reduced, a significant decrease in the amount of delay that people experience while driving in vehicles uh, throughout the region. Next slide. So this is the travel choices scenario. Um, this scenario focused on both active transportation, the concept of um, of uh, complete streets, lowering speeds, making um, more travel choices available on our high activity urban arterials. And then also, um, you know, better or more increased use of telecommuting and other TDM management strategies. Next slide. So, uh, you know, this, this basically doubled the amount of teleworkers that uh, we had back in what, December. Now, now we're probably not quite there in this scenario. Uh, and then uh, that resulted in, you know, significantly fewer uh, drive alone trips to work every day, 400,000. And that's during, you know, the peak times of the day. So 400,000 is obviously a lot fewer trips, especially when you're talking about the peak period trips. Uh, because of the better transit infrastructure, the about 50% increase in bike ped trips. Um, and then a corresponding dip in transit trips. Some of those uh, tr shorter transit trips would be converted to walk and bike trips. Um, so, and even though there there was significant reductions in speeds on some of these arterials, um, there's not that much of a, there is less delay because of the change in mode and uh, fewer trips. Next slide. Yeah, to illustrate that, there's you know a pretty significant decrease in the VMT. A lot of that is attributed to the work from home part of this scenario. Uh, you know, only a 37% increase from 2020 compared to 45. Basically, uh, double the increase in transit walk bike trips and a significant reduction um, in delay for vehicles. Next slide. Final one I'll talk about before we hand it off to Andy for land use um, is a transit scenario. This is a major expansion of the existing uh, transit we have in this region. This includes the completion of fast, fast tracks to the fullest extent, including some additional spurs, extensive BRT uh, network. This is what you see in the red on that map, a BRT network based on uh, RTD's current BRT study. Far, far better transit frequency and uh, service. So it's about, ends up being about eight times as many service hours as RTD's current system. Uh, last, we're talking about free fares um, for all, all people that wanna get on the bus and improve station stop access. Next slide. So it, it ends up, as you might expect, uh, with a significant amount of households having good access to transit um, to get to jobs. You know, it's, a, it's about 20% more households in the region would have good access to jobs. Uh, transit trips increased by about 76%. Um, conversely to the other uh, scenario, the travel choices, there are, is a decrease in walk bike trips because some of those trips are now shifting to transit. And um, about 14% of all households would use transit on a daily basis, about 100,000 more than in the current base. So there is a decrease in uh, VMT, but maybe not as big as we would have expected, about a 2% decrease compared to the base. And then there are obviously um, some equity and personal mobility benefits of free transit being provided to the residents. Next slide. So yeah, not, you know, not the hugest dip in VMT. Um, and we will uh, revisit this scenario later with a land use combination. 
pretty significant increase in transit walk bike trips and um, a dip in vehicle hours of delay. Next slide. I would summarize these first four scenarios. Um, we'll talk about how they uh, they did in achieving some of our MetroVision targets. Uh, we have a target of 23 vehicle miles traveled per person in the region. Um, and none of these scenarios, as you might expect, got there. The orange line is we would prefer for them to get below that line. Travel choices got close, again, primarily due to vehicle mi or to uh, teleworking, but did not quite reach the target. Next slide. Again, looking at a MetroVision target of single reducing single occupancy vehicle mode share to work, the MetroVision target is 65%. Uh, none of these scenarios got us to that target. Next slide. And then minimizing the increase, uh, we are counting on um, delay per person being increased by 2040 or 2050. Um, two of these. This is scenarios, travel choices, and the managed lanes and operations did re reduce person delay enough to get us to our target. Next slide. And I'll pause here for questions. Thank you. So we'll turn to Melinda Stevens again to see if people have their hands raised for questions. Melinda? Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, looks like our first question will be from Director Atchison. I will go ahead and unmute you now so you may speak. Hey, Robert, the question I had goes back to the 270 process from between I-25 and I-70. As we're looking at that project, I think there, as I recall, there's a project in process somewhere in the system specifically to deal with the Vasquez and 270 interchange. Now, the problem in that area there is actually space between the Conoco plant there or Suncor, whatever they call it today, and the ability to put any additional mile lanes in there. Is this project seriously looking at being just adding lanes? Because I don't see that there's physical space, especially when you get around the tank farms. Yeah, it's it's a good question, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for your question. Um, you know, when we were doing these scenarios, we were not exactly looking at engineer engineering level, uh, you know, project level studies. This is really just adding a number to the model to add an additional lane, right? So it's it's more about testing concepts versus specific projects or what, you know, if you're looking at the map there, it's a significant amount of pavement you'd be adding. Probably, you know, that's a very expensive project no matter how much space there is. So we're, we're really testing concepts here, not uh, the specifics of individual projects. Right, because the last time I talked to CDOT, the one project that they had on there was, I believe, was the lane miles in that entire structure. That was in the neighborhood of about six hundred million dollars, but I don't think that took into concept the major rework of the interchange there at Vasquez. Thank you. Great, great comments and questions, um, Melinda Stevens. Are there other folks with their hands raised? Yep. It looks like our next one is from uh, Director Jones. Uh, Director Jones, I will unmute you, and you may speak. Um, so I was just curious about um, the relationship between um, increased transit use but and VMT, and I was a little bit surprised at how little of an impact it had, um, even with um, fare free. So I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, um, thanks for your question, Director Jones. We, I, I would say, um, you know, it, it is important to remember that even though transit is obviously incredibly important to this region, that it is a relatively small portion of total trips in the region. You know, we're, we're talking about, oh, I forget the number, 400,000 or so out of 15 million trips in the region. Um, so, you know, if, if you almost double that, it's still a relatively small chunk of total trips. Um, but there are ways to enhance that. And I think when we talk about complementary land uses later, you're going to see um, how important that is to get more people onto the onto transit. Great, thanks. All right, thank you, Director Jones. It looks like our next question comes from uh, Director Pfeiffer. I will unmute you, so you may ask your question. Oh, give me one second. Okay. All right, Director Pfeiffer, it says that you are self-muted at this point. All right, sound better? Okay. 
So, and, and maybe in the scenario planning, I, I understand, you know, we're just kind of testing out theories and so forth, but, you know, some of these uh, things, I, I feel like we should have a layer of some high level, and I know we're not doing engineering, but high level cost benefit. And I think uh, Director Atchison was kind of hinting that in, in his conversation, because, you know, when I was listening to your scenarios, I mean, these scenarios are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars with very little moving of, of a target. And is that the... Is that maybe more the concept of let's test the theory out and and see it? But I don't hear us ever saying anything at a high level about cost benefits of some of these. Uh, thanks for your question. We are currently doing very high level cost estimates right now. Um, we are planning on presenting those at the April TAC meeting uh, for the first go round. Um, so we, we will have um, you know some numbers to put some level of this. But again, I, I do want to remind this is the first uh, chunk of scenarios. We have a lot more coming in. They, they do get better. They were more interesting. They move the needle more. Yeah, because I think that that gives us an informed decision of, you know, what what strategies in the very far future that we should be focusing on to make those those thoughtful decisions for the region. Because, you know, widening a, a highway through a metropolitan didn't move that needle. And, and I hate that we would spend time focusing on things that have little benefit. Yeah, Director Pfeiffer, this is Jacob. Really do appreciate your question. Robert's right. Um, we will be bringing those forward. We're working on sort of high level, you know, planning level scenario costs. I mean, they're not going to be you know, project specific, but they will give a sense, again, of relative comparisons between scenarios, uh, what the cost differences are. So as we start getting into that conversation of future meetings of implications of these scenarios and what it means for the path forward, that will definitely be part of the conversation. Uh, thank you both. I'll just quickly add that, you know, well, some of some of these, you know, projects wouldn't move the needle on a regional scale. You know, there's there's real benefits to be had at the local and corridor level from, um, you know, any one of these projects. All right. Thank you very much, Director Pfeiffer. All right. Looks like our next question will be from Director Mulvey. I will unmute you now and you should be able to speak. Hi, Deborah Mulvey, Castle Pines alternate. I have a question relating to the slide that was roadway capacity projects. I noticed that the 2040 um, projections showed a particular roadway in my municipality with increased traffic. And this being the 2050 plan shows a different roadway. And so I'm wondering, how that can sink since they're both abutting a third roadway being interstate 25 that's going to be higher capacity throughout 20 30 40 and 50 and it might just be a learning curve for me to understand how that those projections work hi director this is jacob rieger uh, appreciate your question um, so i have the slide up that i think you're referring to is this the slide in question Yes, it is. Do okay. you need me to identify so, the space? It, the, both of them are yellow. Yeah. Um, so just really appreciate your question. So let me clarify on that just a little bit. All we're intending to do with this slide is just show the visual reminder of what's included in our currently adopted 2040 uh, regional transportation plan because, again, we're using our 2040 plan run with 2050 land use, but essentially our 2040 plan as the basis for comparison of all the other scenarios. So as you've started to see in the results, when we're looking at when we're looking at scenario results, we want to compare back to the baseline. The baseline is our adopted plan. So in terms of the details of this network, all these maps are showing is just visually where these projects are. Um, and on the roadway sign, it's showing a little bit additional detail about how they're funded and, and um, when relative to the 2040 plan they might be implemented. Um, but that's just more sort of visual detail. It's really, again, just to show as a reminder, the major projects in our 2040 plan, what we're using as a base for these scenario comparisons. This will all be revisited as we actually develop um, and finalize the 2050 plan. Okay, so the, the 2040 projection showed a particular roadway that was yellow but that roadway is not yellow on this one. So is that just projecting forward? That confused me more, actually. 
Yeah, sorry about that, Director. So on this, on on my screen now, on this slide where you're seeing the different colors on the roadway projects, those are just showing. Uh, they're showing two things from our adopted plan. They're showing how those projects are funded, meaning they're federal or state funded, or whether local funds are being used. And then they're also showing um, what we call air quality staging periods, which is generally the period in which we expect a particular project to come online uh, between now and 2040. This map doesn't show anything about uh, traffic projections or use of the project or anything like that. Thank you. All right, thank you, Director Mulvey. It looks like our next question will be from Director Elrod, and I will unmute you so you may speak. All right, at this time, you're good to go. Thank you. Um, we talked about the scenario of um, what, so the missing element of what would this cost? Um, do we have a scenario of a do nothing scenario? So if we did not, engage in any of these three various options, how that would change um, vehicle, um, miles traveled, et cetera. So perhaps that was represented and I missed that, but I think another element we should be looking at is if we do nothing, what would that look like? Hello, oh, Director Elrod, this is Jacob Rieger again. Appreciate your question. Um, we did talk about that as, as a staff. In some regions that do scenario planning, they do start with uh, what they call an existing plus committed network. So in other words, it would be what's on the ground today and perhaps what's funded through our current transportation improvement program and starting with that as a base. We felt like, and again, there's no right or wrong answer here. We just felt like as a staff that for purposes of comparison that we're looking at different versions of the future and we do have an adopted transportation plan as we just talked about in the last question so to us it just made sense let's start with our sort of adopted plan as the base and then think about as we get into these scenarios how do those scenarios potentially represent change from the adopted plan course that we're currently on okay okay thank you Okay, thank you for your question, Director Elrod. And at this point, I am not seeing any other hands, so I will turn it back over to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Just to remind everybody to use the hand raise feature, and if you're having any difficulty with that, you can use the chat um, and send staff questions, or you can text message me on my phone at 303-570-9614 if you're still having trouble. Otherwise, um, we'll go back to Jacob and his staff to continue presenting. Jacob? Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. So as we get into um, the next part of the presentation, we wanna talk a little bit about the land use scenarios that we're using in this analysis, and I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Andy, to do that. All right, thank you, Jacob. Uh, so I have, next slide, yeah. First, before we start talking about how these land use scenarios are different, I just wanna remind everyone, touch base on uh, how they're actually held constant throughout the different land use scenarios we looked at. As Alvin mentioned already, household and job growth, we held constant in each scenario. So we're assuming the same amount of household growth, the same amount of job growth through 2050. All of them are anchored to local plans or zoning based on the best available information. Uh, so if one of the scenarios assumes an increase in capacity for jobs or housing, uh, that increase is done relative to what's in place now. What that really means is that an increase in capacity in Denver and Castle Rock would look different because um, they start out at a different place. Now, we're also assuming that the different scheduled development data that we've been collecting and accumulating about approved uh, plats and uh, developments is already included in the scenarios in the same way throughout. Uh, that results in about 200,000 new units being assumed between now and 2050. Um, that is just to provide some realism to this, knowing that there are already plans in place. Uh, we're not proposing to change those. Um, and we've also made no changes to the predictive parts of the model itself. Those are held constant throughout. What we're actually changing are the choices available. Next slide. Uh, so we introduce change by assuming, like I said, different choices are available for where households and jobs can locate. Uh, what that means is assuming more or less capacity for jobs or housing uh, than what current zoning or plans would allow for. Uh, both the infill and center scenarios are sourced directly from MetroVision uh, and they focus on different areas as you'll see in the next slides. Next slide. 
Our region is about the size of Connecticut spatially. However, according to the Census Bureau, what they consider to be urban or really non-rural is only about 15% of that space. Uh, the infill scenario itself uh, focuses on a subset of that urban area, about 11%, um, allowing for modest intensification over a broader area than the center scenario, which really only targets about 3% of the region's land area. Uh, the result of making these different choices available, um, next slide. Uh, the result of making these different choices available is that the infill scenario captures about three fourths of the household growth to increase its share of uh, total households. Think of this like market share, the market is growing, but the share itself is also growing of how much is located in that area. Uh, the center's area is a much smaller geography it captures less than a fifth of all households to start, but captures nearly two thirds of the growth in this scenario, uh, but just by making different choices available. Uh, while that 37% might not seem like a large share of household, it reflects a significant focusing of development activity. Uh, next slide. All right, so now we've got maps to really try and show uh, where uh, development is happening, where household growth is happening throughout the region in these scenarios. Uh, these maps illustrate only where the most intense activity would be uh, occurring. Um, not all activity, there's a, a household growth happening throughout the region in, in all different scenarios. Alone, each map may not reveal much insight about where growth is happening, but when you start comparing them back to the baseline map, you can start to see some subtle differences about where that uh, more intense growth may be uh, focused. However, uh, just maps alone uh, might not show much. The numbers here uh, may actually be more illustrative of how uh, these scenarios are different from one another. Uh, comparing the scenarios shows that between baseline, infill, and centers, uh, they're progressively more dense. Uh, they're more centers focused uh, in terms of our households and jobs uh, targets from MetroVision. Those targets you see on the far right are actually 2040 targets from MetroVision itself. Uh, so you can see how we're doing compared to those targets by 2050 in these scenarios. Um, the rest of this shows some more metrics that are not related directly to MetroVision, but are related to some of the topics that came up uh, during uh, scenario development. Uh, in terms of jobs and housing balance, one of the things we looked at was where is household growth occurring uh, in comparison to um, some of the major employment centers in the region? And throughout these uh, scenarios, we see that there's more opportunity for this growth to locate closer to one of these centers. That doesn't necessarily mean that folks that are locating there have a job in one of those employment centers, but it just means that that opportunity is there uh, to locate closer to that opportunity. Uh, we have uh, more development focused away from existing single family areas throughout these, which was an interesting finding for us. Uh, we also see that um, the, the center scenario is extremely focused in some of the, the most intense uh, range of development uh, intensity uh, that we looked at uh, when we compared uh, the different scenarios. So we're seeing that the centers really, the household growth is really focused on some of the highest ranges of uh, uh, development activity. And I think that might be it. Thank you. Do we have questions from members? Uh, Melinda Stevens, if you could take questions from folks with their hands raised. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. And at this point, I do not see any hands raised. Thank you. Back over to you, Jacob. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, now as we get into sort of the second set of results, here, we're starting to combine the two land use scenarios that Andy just talked about, the infill scenario and the center scenario, with some of what we think are the complementary uh, transportation scenarios that we talked about earlier. So specifically, as you see on this slide, we combined the infill scenario. Uh, we ran it first kind of by itself so we could just see the results of the infill scenario by itself. And then we ran it with the travel choices transportation scenario. Similarly, the center's land use scenario uh, we first ran by itself so we could see those results. And then we ran the center scenario with the transit transportation scenario. So again, on the infill scenario, just that reminder um, of what that looks like. 
So when we run just the infill scenario, and again, just like the slides you saw previously, we are making a comparison to 2050 base. So this time we're just running the infill scenario before we get to any of the transportation scenarios. Uh, we saw a 6% decrease in vehicle miles traveled. Uh, people in vehicles experienced 11% less delay on average. And we saw almost twice as many transit trips, as well as a 50% increase in walk and bike trips. Um, as Andy talked about with this scenario, uh, a range of housing options across the region uh, would hopefully benefit individuals and families and can improve the economic vitality and diversity of local communities. Um, additionally, we also think in this scenario that commercial vehicle trips decrease with consolidation of stops. Um, and if you think back to, again, what the infill scenario is, is, as we're literally doing a little bit of that infill, uh, we think we would see that benefit on the commercial vehicle side as well. Um, so again, some of the same metrics that you saw earlier uh, with the transportation scenarios. When we look at vehicle miles traveled, um, again, we're looking at the change from 2020 and we're comparing it to the 2050 base. So when we run just the infill scenario by itself, we see a little bit of decrease in vehicle miles travel. We see a significant increase in transit walk and bicycle trips. Um, and we actually see less vehicle hours uh, of delay in this scenario as well. So now let's put the infill scenario together with the travel choices transportation scenario. Um, again, a reminder the travel choices scenario was the sort of urban arterial, uh, multimodal complete street, safety, uh, emphasis type of scenario. And we put that together with, uh, with the infill land use scenario. So when we do that, uh, we saw several interesting things. Um, again, uh, we're comparing against the 2050 base. We saw that vehicle miles travel decreased by 14.5 million each day. So 11% less VMT compared to the 2050 base. We saw twice as many walk and bike trips, which is about 16% of all trips taken in the region. Uh, we also saw more transit trips than in the transit scenario by itself. And so when we look at these graphs, again, comparing uh, change from 2020, but comparing to the 2050 base, um, you see that, you know, pretty, pretty significant decrease in vehicle miles traveled, a very significant increase in transit, walk, and bicycle trips, and then a decrease in vehicle hours of delay. Let me show Okay. So um, in this scenario, we wanted to we wanted to make some comparisons because now we're talking about sort of several components. And so we wanted to sort of isolate but compare those components. So on this slide, um, you're seeing graphs that show in the gray the 2050 base. The orange is the infill land use scenario by itself. The green is the travel choices transportation scenario by itself. And then the blue is the infill and the travel choices scenario run together. So when you, when you array those together in, in this graph, in this bar chart, um, you can see the, um, the corresponding decrease in vehicle miles traveled, um, again, as compared to uh, change from 2020 compared to the 2050 base. And you see, uh, similarly, a significant increase in transit walk and bicycle trips. So let me pause there again for questions. Any questions? I am seeing no hands raised at this time. Thank you. Okay, I will continue, Madam Chair. Yes, please. Thank you, Jacob. Okay, so that was the infill land use scenario with, with transportation scenarios. Now let's talk about the center's land use scenario. And again, just a reminder, uh, remember, as Andy said, this is only about 3% of the region's area. It's a very targeted, uh, very focused um, scenario on the land use side. So again, we first ran the center's land use scenario by itself, just so we could see the results um, compared to the 2050 base. We saw an 8% decrease in vehicle miles traveled. We saw over three times as many transit trips and over twice as many walk and bicycle trips. Uh, we also saw in this scenario that the average person delay per trip decreases by 27%, um, and that's sort of a regional figure across the region. Some localized areas did experience more congestion, though. 
So just showing what that looks like, again, change from 2020 compared to our 2050 base, um, you see the decrease in vehicle miles traveled. You see the very significant increase in transit walk and bicycle trips. And then you see the decrease in vehicle hours of delay, um, again, just from the center's land use scenario by itself so far. So now we put the center's land use scenario together with the transit transportation scenario. Um, so again, in the center scenario, we're focusing uh, housing and jobs around those key centers and corridors. Um, this one, we also have a cost component uh, regarding driving and parking. Um, and I'll show you that in a few slides. And then the transit scenario, remember, um, completion of fast tracks with additional rail, the very extensive bus rapid transit network from RTD's regional BRT uh, study, and the significant increase in transit service, as well as free fares and improved access to transit. So when we put these two uh, scenarios together, again, compared with the 2050 base change from 2020, we saw vehicle miles travel decrease 24%. We saw three times as many walk and bicycle trips, and we saw six times as many transit trips. Um, and as you see in parentheses, 2.4 million transit trips uh, per day. Um, so a couple observations here, uh, more total person trips, since there's more uh, free time for short trips, we think in this scenario, so just the level of trip making activity has increased. But people in vehicles experience 50% less delay on average in this combination of scenarios. So here's the bar charts on this. Um, again, uh, change from 2020 compared to our 2050 base. And again, this is the center's land use scenario run with the transit transportation scenario. Uh, we see significant decrease in vehicle miles traveled, um, sort of the exponential increase in transit walk and bicycle trips, and then pretty significant decrease in vehicle hours of delay in this scenario, a combination of scenarios. So just like before, we've got a lot of things going on here. So we wanted to show you both in isolation and together um, how, how these combinations and components influence uh, some of these outcomes. So again, in gray is the 2050 base. The transit scenario by itself is in green. The center's land use scenario by itself is in orange. And then the center's and transit scenario together are in uh, light blue. And then in dark blue, we have uh, the centers and transit plus the vehicle costs that I mentioned earlier. And that's the cost to sort of operate and, and park a vehicle um, that we have in our traffic model. So we wanted to bring a cost component um, on top of everything else to see how that would change the metrics as well. So again, when you look at vehicle miles traveled here, you see the significant decreases as we start making some of these combinations. And similarly, you see significant increases in transit walk and bicycle trips. So we'll pause for questions in just a moment, but wanted to show you, um, as Robert did before, um, how these scenarios kind of array against our Metro Vision targets. Um, so again, as a reminder, our Metro Vision target is the orange bar. Um, so this one, reducing daily vehicle miles traveled per person, per capita, uh, we have that 2040 target of 23. Um, and as you can see here with these combinations of scenarios, uh, we get close on several of them um, and actually achieve it in the centers plus transit uh, scenario combination. Similarly, on our Metro Vision target of reducing single occupant vehicle mode share to work uh, to 65%, um, three of the scenarios get us there and two of the scenarios, the center scenario by itself, and then the centers plus transit scenario um, actually well exceed, uh, meaning they do much better um, than, than the target for this, for this measure. And then finally, minimizing that increase of daily person delay per capita. Uh, we're aiming for less than nine minutes by 2040. Um, and as you can see here, again, several of these combinations actually do much better. Uh, most of them do much better than this Metro Vision target. And so with that, Madam Chair, let me pause and take uh, questions on that set of slides. Thank you. So folks with questions, remember to raise your hands. Melinda Stevens, do we have any folks with comments or questions or discussion items? I am not seeing any hands raised. Thank you. Oh, I'm Jacob. sorry, I take that back. My apologies. It looks like one just popped up. Um, Director Jones, I will go ahead and unmute you at this time. And now it says that you are self-muted. So Director Jones, if you just want to unmute yourself, then we can take some comments from you. Uh, it looks like she is unmuted. I don't know if maybe she's cutting out or 
having maybe some connectivity issues. I'll give you just another couple moments. We yeah, can't hear Go ahead. We can't hear you right now, Director Jones, so we're going to continue on. But if you want to close out and log back in, that usually fixes people's connection problems. And then just raise your hand again, and we will take your question and comment as soon as that comes through. Jacob, you want to continue on? Sure. And we are actually very near the end. So just a few more slides that we wanted to show you. I'm going to turn this section over to my colleague, Robert, um, to talk about electric and automated vehicles. Robert? Uh, yes, thank you, Jacob. Uh, so uh, just going to take another look at a MetroVision target we have, uh, reducing daily transportation greenhouse gas emissions per capita. The target is to reduce by about uh, 60 percent um, from 2010, and that, that results in a target of about 10 uh, pounds per day of greenhouse gas emissions per capita. Um, so even the centers and transit scenario doesn't quite get us to that target. Um, so, um, you know, it lends itself to, to making us feel like we have to rely on vehicle technology as well here. As you can see, if um, the current uh, emissions in blue basically take into effect uh, the current CAFE standards as they were proposed a couple days ago, um, that the change um, that happened a couple days ago has not been incorporated into moves and is under litigation. So these are the current CAFE standards that inch up basically um, increased miles or decrease of miles per gallon um, from about 2025 and then there's no further regulation after that. Um, so when you look at the change coming with electric vehicles and their growing popularity and um, fiscal sense, um, you know if you look at a scenario where about 25 percent of all the vehicles driving around on our roads are electric by 2050, um, that gets us there um, with the centers and transit scenario. Obviously, this could be anywhere from, you know, the 5% to 100% that we um, we might expect by 2050. So if you 75% of the vehicles were electric in 2050, we far exceed our target, regardless of what scenario there is. Uh, next slide. And then we're just going to talk briefly about automated and connected vehicles. I know this is a really hot item to discuss. Um, we ran a couple scenarios, um, kind of one that highlighted some of the potential efficiencies or pros of connected vehicles and one that um, looked at the potential downsides or maybe, you know, there's some people that feel that it even reduces capacity. Some people that feel like we will have, you know, an advanced TNC network, a ride sharing network, where people are sharing vehicles and things are really positive. It's probably gonna end up being some combination of both of those things. Um, but we just wanted to say we did do this work and we've, as you can see here, there's kind of a wide range of possibilities, no matter what metric you're looking at, whether you're talking about VMT or delay or uh, how many people are in every vehicle. Um, it's really difficult to tell right now. There's There are so many unknowns about this. We didn't wanna directly incorporate them into the, any of the models, um, but there is a handout. Um, we You can see some of the results we came up with. Um, and uh, you know it's just a really big unknown for us right now as we uh, adopt this plan and um, we are definitely keeping tabs on it. Okay, thank you, Robert. So we're actually at our very last slide. I just kind of wanted to summarize this conversation and remind you of where we think we're headed for this. Um, so as I said at the beginning, you know, today, given the volume of information that we just presented to you, as well as the table that's in the packet, really, we just wanted to um, help you kind of absorb and hopefully understand um, all the results that we're showing to you today. Um, as we get into sort of future meetings, starting with our April Transportation Advisory Committee, um, as I said, we want to start talking about the implications of scenario results for our 2050 plan. You know, so here's a couple sort of guidance questions on that. You know, how should scenario results shape project identification and evaluation? How should scenario results shape the financial plan investment strategies? Um, and then as we get into spring and summer and preparing um, our draft 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, uh, we'll be going through a process of identifying and soliciting candidate projects for fiscal constraint that we'll include in the plan. And we'll be preparing a 2050 financial plan uh, that looks at all revenues and expenditures, regardless of source, um, for our multimodal transportation system as part of preparing the 2050 plan. 
Um, as I mentioned, we did present this to our Transportation Advisory Committee um, at their March meeting a week ago Monday. Um, it was just an informational item, so we didn't ask for action on this, just as we're not asking for action here. Um, but it was a very good conversation, I think a very positive conversation, uh, many similar questions and themes of, of discussion so far um, in terms of these scenario results. Um, so with that, Madam Chair, uh, we are done and we appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. So we'll turn it over for discussion and final questions and comments. So we'll start with Commissioner Jones. Uh, Melinda, if you could unmute her and just see if we can hear her this time. Absolutely. Okay. Director Jones, you were unmuted. Yay. All right. I I, I uh, went out of the meeting and came back in and that did the trick. So thanks for bearing with me. Um, no, I just, I wanted to comment on um, what it seems, what one of the takeaways seems to be the synergistic impact of land use and transportation and the need to really look at combinations of sort of policy and scenarios um, if we really want to meet our metro vision goals. That seems to be one of the key take homes on this. And uh, I guess I'm curious from staff whether or not that's also where they would lead us. I mean, also the, the notion that the, the centers um, seems to in particular have the a biggest impact as the scenarios go as well. Yeah, Director Jones, this is Jacob. Um, I think just based on what we're seeing of these results, I think that's a correct observation that, and we structured the results this way to sort of layer on top as we added combinations of things or different components so that you all could see you know how the changes and how the needle moves based on based on these different combinations. So I think you're correct that um, you know when we did these uh, sort of couple land use and transportation scenarios together, we did definitely see more changes than either land use alone or transportation alone. Thank you, um, Director Jones. Do you have any other comments or questions? No, that's good. Melinda, could you please call on the next person with their hand raised? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. It looks like our next question will be from Director Brockett. I will go ahead and unmute you now, and you should be good to speak. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. yes. great. Um, well, I'll just echo Director Jones's comments about the, that synergistic nature of the, the land use changes and then the infrastructure investments. Um, but then just also make the point, so the, the land use scenarios, the, that's really about zoning decisions, and so there's not necessarily much of a cost to them as I understand how you're presenting it. The different infrastructure scenarios, it seemed like almost all of them are going to be more than the resource, than um, the amounts that the region could afford in that time period, probably by a fair margin. And so is the thought being that, okay, you use these as a sort of fiscally unconstrained example to construct the scenarios and then say, well, we know we can't quite build that much, but the money that we do have, this would inform which direction we should go with the available funds. Is that how you're thinking about it or, or something different? Yeah, Director Brockett, this is Jacob Rieger. Thank you for your question. Um, I think that's correct in the sense that um, these scenarios were not fiscally constrained from a cost perspective. Um, as we said in response to an earlier question, we are working on high level, you know, planning level scenario um, costs uh, for each of these scenarios that we'll bring at a future meeting uh, to help inform that part of the conversation. But um, yes, for purposes of this work today, we did think of them as fiscally unconstrained. And really the point there is that you know, and you've seen now the results of, of how different they can be. We wanted to bring very different versions of the future for you, you know, forward for you to to examine. If we were if we were very tentative in what we brought forward, you wouldn't see nearly so much change. And the point here is to see if you take a particular type of scenario to its extreme is maybe a strong word, but you know, to its full envisioning, then you get a sense of what that change looks like. And then we can sort of back out and say, okay if we like or don't like certain things in a particular scenario or combination scenarios, that then can inform, you know, what can we afford over the planning horizon. I will say that, um, you know, with a 2050 plan, we're looking at 30 years. And so we all agree that there's not enough funding for transportation, but we are trying to take the longer view here of, you know, there are going to be some resources available to this region over 30 years. You know, what is the best sort of 
you know, investment of those of those dollars to help the region achieve its vision. Thanks for that. Thank you. Next question. At this point, I see no other hands raised. All right, this is your last opportunity to raise your hand if you have something to comment on. So please do it now if you'd like to make a comment. All right, seeing no one, um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this meeting, um, our first electronic work meeting ever and doing your part to stay safer at home. Thank you all for helping slow the spread of COVID-19 by doing this meeting remotely. I'd like to thank everyone one more time and I look forward to talking with you all again later this month electronically. Have a great day, we are adjourned. <laughs>